Welcome to This Is Money podcast. I'm Georgie Frost and joining me and fresh from his holidays, Simon Lambert today is Helen Crane. And coming up, do we have a mortgage price war on our hands? Okay, maybe let's not go that far, but a fair few lenders have dropped their rates recently. Does it mean at least that the mayhem is over. Wages are finally set to beat inflation, but many won't benefit. Will higher mortgage rates wipe out your pay rise? Also today, NS and I have made premium bonds even more attractive. So are they now a no-brainer? Simon wants to give some credit where credit's due. Would you pay for a mystery holiday? And Helen went viral on social media recently. I saw it. I got excited. But why? Don't be getting so up to date with all the latest breaking money news. Just go to thisismoney.co.uk or download the app. Don't forget, you can stay on top of what's going on in the markets by tuning in to the Digest and Invest podcast by eToro. Go to your regular podcast platform and listen on the go. Digest and Invest by eToro, the podcast for those interested in trading and investing. The first, a handful of lenders have cut their mortgage rates this week, easing some of the pressure on homeowners. Why are they doing it? Will others follow suit? And hello will rates go? Simon, welcome back. I hope you had a lovely holiday and we're keeping up to date with what's been going on back here, being the money professional that you are. What's been going on in the world of housing and mortgages this week? It might be a bit of a surprise to see that rates are falling, given that the Bank of England has just raised interest rates and is suspected to do it a little bit more as well. What's going on? Well, thanks, Georgie. And thanks for the welcome back. I was, of course, keeping up to date with what was going on, not minute by minute. I was trying to studiously ignore that, but I would occasionally casually have a glance at stuff. But mortgages, I walked back into a different scenario to the one that I left. Mortgage rates are now being cut. So we have seen months of rates going up. We've seen repeated suggestions from yours truly that we might be at the moment of peak panic only for lenders to continue pulling mortgage deals and keep raising rates Um, never underestimate your ability to be consistently wrong um, in the face of what would seem like common sense Uh, but I, I think we got to the point where the rate panic has subsided slightly the Bank of England has delivered another two rises Big, you know, a big rise, a 0.5% rise initially, and then another quarter point rise. Um, And the markets can see the end in sight for rate rises. Inflation is going to come down. We had some dodgy inflation numbers that fueled the worries that sent the the rate panic into overdrive and led to, to banks pulling mortgages, trying not to be caught out by being the one offering the cheapest loan and everything. But there comes a point where a banks and builder societies have raised mortgages so high that they have actually throttled demand by potentially more than they want to do. And B banks and building societies look at that scenario and say, do you know what, actually at this level, we can be pretty comfortable that we're going to make money. And we don't think the bank of England is just going to keep going and keep going and keep going until the base rate hits 15%. And also C they go, Oh, hang on a minute we want to write some mortgage business here and make a bit of money. And Mm -hmm. we've now raised rates to the point where actually we're sort of killing the demand off and we want to, we want to battle for rates. We want to battle for a bit of business. So we've seen some of the big banks come in with some big, big cuts. Um, We've seen nationwide cut. We've seen Halifax cut. We've seen NatWest cut. You know, these are big, big lending names. And what this says is, yeah, maybe we're not as open for business as we were, 18 months ago but we're definitely open for business and we definitely want your business and we definitely want to make some money now the problem for borrowers of course is the exact same problem that they had when i went on holiday but just in a slightly different direction should i take a mortgage now or should i just sit tight because rates are they going to keep coming down Mm. you know two and a half weeks ago it was rates are they going to keep going up but when's that going to stop and when are they going to come down now it looks like okay rates may have stopped and hit that peak when are they going to come down it's this, exactly the same question and the difficulty is for people who need a mortgage right now or within the next month or two months but then there's lots of other people who need a mortgage in the next six months or so who are sitting there going hmm what do i do and you know in all honesty 
there's no definitive answer to that, unfortunately. No, there's not. Probably speak to a professional, I'd suggest. That's a good starting point. Helen, I'm just looking at the uh, average two and five year fixes. Goodness me, we've not seen them fall this far since, well, last month, actually, um, when they were a little bit lower than they are right now. So average figures looking pretty scary still, sort of about 6.8 for a two year fix, 6.28 for a five year fix. But with all these cuts that we're seeing, if you look around, you can get something decent. But caveat, caveat, you probably need a big deposit or a load of equity, right? What are we actually, give us some figures. Yeah, absolutely. So these averages, they do look quite scary. They're obviously much higher than people have been used to over the last couple of years. There's no kind of getting around that. But if you do look at these deals, uh, and it's particularly the sort of big high street lenders uh, have brought out over the last couple of weeks, you know, they are chunky cuts. So a lot of them have been cutting their rates by half a percent, some of them even more than half a percent. NatWest has reduced its fixed rates by 0.65 percentage points. That's on two and five year deals. Virgin Money has made some big cuts. Um, It's got an 80% loan to value doing out 5.6% which is actually not bad in the scheme of kind of where we are now. So if you're looking at a two-year fix, the cheapest deals you can get at the minute are about 59 to 6%. If you're looking for a five-year fix, uh, it's cheaper, about 52 to 5.3%. So clearly higher than people are used to, but those figures are starting to, to come down to, to more sort of reasonable levels that said you know if you're coming up for remortgage you're still quite likely to have quite a big sort of shock Uh, what do you suspect Helen will they continue to fall are all eyes on next week's inflation figures yeah the inflation figures next week are, are going to be really important so that's next Wednesday and it's the inflation figure for July so at the minute analysts are saying might fall to about 6.87%. So that would be down from 7.9% the previous month, which would be be really good news, you know, inflation heading in the the direction we want it to. But that's still much higher than the Bank of England's inflation target, which is 2%. Most people are still saying the Bank of England is likely to put its base rate up again. When that happens, banks tend to put their mortgage rates up, or at least in this case, I think we'll kind of keep them where they are. You know, I don't think anyone is saying we're going to see big sustained falls in mortgage rates for for you know months and months on end a lot of people in the mortgage property world are saying perhaps they'll settle at about four or five percent um when everything kind of calms down so perhaps you know some more kind of falls to come but it's not going to go rock bottom anytime soon unfortunately so i just want to take a higher level view i guess of the whole housing market and that and that includes rents at the moment because we've got some figures out this week about mortgage arrears and ticking up slightly for for homeowners up quite a lot for buy to let landlords lenders are wanting to perhaps entice people in a little bit more or not scare them off so much because we're seeing the housing market slow down but the rental market is red hot at the moment troubled times troubled times indeed what you're seeing here is the fact that many buy-to-let landlords, not all of them, um, and certainly there's a very large number of buy-to-let landlords who are not mortgaged, but many buy-to-let landlords have leveraged investments, so they have borrowed in order to fund their investment. And in, in fact, actual fact, even some you know fairly big multiple property landlords will have done this because it's been the most financially savvy way of structuring things when rates were super low unfortunately when rates move against you and costs go up then you've got a problem and your earnings could be decimated um, and landlords have got you know mortgage rates going up more than um residential mortgage rates they've got extra costs coming in from regulation and they're paying more tax than they were so that's all feeding through to them trying to pass on rent rises to their tenants and we are in the situation where there is lots of rental demand and that means that landlords are able in most places to capitalize and say very sorry or maybe not even say very sorry but just your rent's going up and if you won't pay it someone else will and the problem for people is of course that this is very much focused on the better the property the better the standard of property and i don't just mean like obviously it's a massive great five bedroom house versus a one bedroom flat. I mean, if you take apples and compare them with apples, if you take two one bedroom flats, the nice one 
which is all up to scratch and the landlords really looked after it and everything like that they can ask more money for it and they're more likely to be able to get more money for it um and obviously location matters and all those other things but yeah it, it's making it really really painful for renters who many of them will be hoping to save money in order to become potentially homeowners and are watching that being chased further into the distance by the fact that mortgage rates are going up so they might have found themselves close to the point where potentially they could buy and you look at it and you go well, why do you want to buy i mean you know mortgage rates are really high house prices are high they're probably mm. going to fall but they go because i don't want to have to move flat every 12 months at best yep. and have to pay more every time and when i move in i the landlord agrees that they're going to replace this carpet and paint this wall and fix that broken thing and then they just don't ever bother to do it and i go and contact the agent and the agent really couldn't care less um and and so on and so on so that's why people want to own their own home um but that's being chased further away from them at the same time as they're having to pay more in rent so it's a very unfortunate situation and it's certainly a very different situation to the one that we were seeing not so long ago during the pandemic when mm. obviously you know being in the city was out and the rental market was reasonably dead unless it was the kind of renting some cottage in the middle of the countryside because the world had completely changed and everybody was just going to be able to work from sort of some bucolic location for the rest of their lives now people have discovered that actually they need to go back into the office in the city and so on and there's been a big big demand for moving back into major cities um not just london but also particularly the regional cities are driving a lot of this rental inflation. Helen, in the 80s, we had the yuppies. Now we've got the rise of the guppies, not the fish. What are we talking about? Yeah, so the guppies, um, interestingly named group. This is a breed of people under the age of 40, young professionals, and they're called guppies because they have given up on property. Research by Zoopla, which found that 38% of renters who earn more than £60,000 a year will not try and buy in the next 10 years. So that's, you know, if they're on more than £60,000 a year now, in 10 years time, they could be on substantially more than that. And they still don't think they'll be able to buy in the next decade. Um, Just one in five of them say they will definitely be able to afford a home in that time scale. Um, So they're calling them guppies. You know, it's a contrast to 80s and 90s when you had yuppies, you know, these upwardly mobile urban professionals um, who were seen as having, you know, a lot of disposable income. It just shows how much things have turned around. So even people who are earning, you know, compared to the average earnings in the UK, that these people are earning a lot of money and they still think that getting on the property ladder is completely out of reach for them and you know that as we've been talking about high rents completely leads into that because if you're in this situation where you know your rent's going up every time you move every year every two years then of course it makes it more difficult to save even if your wage has gone up in that time you know if you're paying a few hundred pounds a month more on your rent then you know that's that's kind of cancelled out it's really difficult you know obviously we have to say this this largely depends on where you live so this is going to be probably much more acute for people who live in the south of England I'm sure there are people in other areas who aren't necessarily struggling as much but you know it it depends on a multitude of factors doesn't it are you are you on your own are you with a partner how much do you earn how what prospects do you have for kind of earning more so I think it is something that uh, that affects people all across the country Indeed, and I can attest that moving is a very expensive thing to do. I mean, it's the cost of the the removal vans, the cost of the deep clean, just the crossover sometimes when you have to be paying two rents at once. It is an expensive business. Simon, where will this all land, do you think? I know this is sort of our favourite crystal ball gazing, but what are the experts suggesting a a mortgage rate's going to go down significantly? I mean, we're seeing that wages are finally set to beat inflation, but look, many people won't benefit because higher mortgage rates will wipe that out. Yes, and and that is a a genuine issue, um, which we'll come on to in a minute, I guess, this this mortgage rise is wiping out people's pay rises. But in terms of where mortgage rates are going to go from here, we could find ourselves back in the scenario that we found ourselves in after the uh, Liz Trust quasi Quateng mini budget chaos, where the Bank of England continued to raise interest rates, but mortgage rates came down. If we cast our minds back, really not too far. I know you like it when I make the kind of cast your mind back noise. Um, what happened after the mini budget was a rate panic 
Um, lenders pulled rates, lenders kept hiking rates. We reached the point of peak panic. Uh, markets were then calmed and mortgage rates then started to drift down. And they drifted down you know, nicely until kind of round about the sort of just after Easter time kind of scenario. And then we had another rate panic and they've rocketed back up again. It's likely, barring some weird in outlier inflation based surprises you know suddenly inflation like jumps back up another percentage point or something and then remains there barring something like that it's likely that mortgage rates are probably going to continue to drift downwards but they are going to be much much higher than they were in the recent past and most of the recent past we are probably going to see the best five-year fixed rate mortgages fall back below 5%, for example. Might take some time, might take, you know, at least the rest of the year for that to happen. We're probably going to see the gap between those and two-year fixes start to narrow. And they're probably going to end up round about maybe about the same level again. But people are still going to be looking down the barrel of paying 5% on their mortgage, not 2% on their mortgage, which makes a very, very big difference to the amount of money that you have to pay each month, at which point, I will hand over to our expert, Helen Crane, who wrote a story about this that we published today. Before we get there, Simon, I think we need to work. That was a close encounters kind of sound. It's more like. Oh, OK. Sorry. Yeah. It's must yeah. be the holiday brain. Still got holiday yeah, brain. Exactly. On. So work on that for next time. Helen, apologies. So this is a story that I wrote today. It's about wages versus mortgage increases. Right. So there's been a lot of news this week and uh, people have really welcomed this news. So looking at predictions from economists, there are predictions that wage inflation is expected to start outstripping CPI inflation uh, as of the the sort of announcement next week. So, as I said, they think CPI inflation is set to fall to about 7 percent earnings are uh, set to rise by slightly more than 7 percent. So last year or so people's wages have been rising uh, less than the price of things they buy that's we're about to kind of hit a turning point on that people are predicting uh, so that's good news some people have been saying this is a sign that the cost of living crisis might be coming to an end sounds like very good news however i've spoken to a few economists this week and they're saying that for homeowners with mortgages the amount that they've seen their monthly mortgage bill go up by could basically cancel out those pay rises completely. Perhaps even they'll even be uh, paying more. So big risk for people who do own a home. You know, these these wage rises might kind of mean nothing given that their mortgage payments are going up so much. So this is obviously when they remortgage. So bad news, I'm afraid. I'd like to try and be a bit positive on this kind of thing. But it's looking like it's it's still kind of tough times out there for for lots of people who do own their own their homes with a mortgage. Of course, there are things you can do to try and bring your mortgage rate down. We're hearing from brokers that some people are doing things like extending the term of their mortgage just to keep their payments down in the short term. But you know, things like that come with with really big risk. You don't want to be stuck doing things like that for for too long a time. So it's yeah, it's a, it's, it's a tricky situation. And, and this is true because. If you're somebody, for example, in the fortunate position of earning £50,000 a year and you get a 10% pay rise, that's pretty good. You're going to be pretty happy about that, £5,000 a year. There's a problem, though, of course, that due to the stealth tax freezing of tax thresholds, the higher rate tax threshold has remained stuck at £50,000 a year. So you're going to lose... 40% of every extra pound that you are paid in tax. And that's just income tax. So that means that your £5,000 a year is going to be reduced to £3,000. But it's still not bad, you know, £3,000. Divide that by 12, you're going to get an extra £250 a month after tax. If your mortgage has gone up by £400, which many people are finding that theirs has, and some are finding that it's gone up by much, much more, you're not going to be feeling richer. In fact, you're going to be feeling poorer. There's also the problem of inflation. Now, of course, your pay rise is meant to help you match inflation. As Helen said, we're starting to see real wage growth. But we haven't seen real wage growth consistently for so long that people have spent many years not getting any richer and you can this kind of thing can continue 
on and on and on and on. And then there comes a point where for some reason, people just suddenly flip and twig to all this stuff. And I think we crossed that point at some point, maybe over the last year. All of a sudden, people who largely pay very little attention to the com- the combination between inflation and wages and real wages. And it gets a bit geeky and they switch off. Know what's going on here. Who knows why? Is it the union talk? Is it the, uh, the cost of living crisis? Is it inflation being in the news? Is it just a finally people realizing, hang on a minute, I appear to be getting consistently poorer. Um, then also on top of that, people have twigged with the tax thing and the stealth tax thing again something you can get away with for quite a long time and we have really been doing for quite a long time just eating eating in and eating in and eating in to people's earnings and then all of a sudden people start to feel it you saw the massive backlash against the the freezing of the high rate tax threshold recently and it's got to the point where people have twigged this to the point where even people who don't pay high rate tax are really annoyed about this because actually fundamentally lots of people who don't pay high rate tax would hope to pay it one day they'd hope the wages would go up by enough and if you look at real wages in this country, the situation is quite frankly appalling. If you go digging into the Office for National Statistics uh, data series, you will find the real average weekly earnings using CPI data, date of last publication, 11th of July 2023. And this looks at average weekly earnings, which is the ONS's preferred uh, measure of earnings, and it adjusts it for inflation. Now, at the moment, real AWE, May 2023, £497 a week. Once you start going backwards up the series, you start to find a very ugly situation because it was also £497 a week in March 2019. So basically, on average, nobody has got any richer in the last four years and a bit. But it gets worse than that because you can keep scrolling upwards and then you get to August 2010, 497 pounds. Nobody on average in this country has got richer since August 2010. But it gets worse. You can keep going. Wow. November 2005. On average, adjusted for inflation. The average worker in this country has not got any richer since November 2005. That is so far back that it is the exact point at which I started working at This Is Money as a reporter. <laughs> wow. Simon. And if you'd have said, if I'd have written a story when I started, my editor said, I want you to write me a story saying that over the next 18 years, nobody's going to get any richer it would have been considered ridiculous. But that is the situation that we're in. And that's why when you suddenly find a scenario like the the mortgage spike hitting people, cost of living crisis and things like that, it's so bad for us in the UK is because our wages have gone absolutely nowhere on average since November 2005. Now, to be fair, they have actually risen, but then they've fallen back down again each time. Um, And what we need to get in this country is some kind of consistent real wage growth. And it is something that creates a problem when you have people like Andrew Bailey on his 500 grand a year Mm -hmm. salary telling people not to ask for pay rises because everyone goes, hmm, haven't got any richer in the last 18 years. That's it for part one. I'm joined now by Ben Laidlow of Etoro for our weekly look at what's been happening on the markets. Ben, how has the past week been? It's been a volatile week for the FTSE. We've been impacted by some of this natural profit taking we've seen coming out of US markets after their record-breaking rally for the first seven months of the year. Uh, And secondly, closer to home, this better than expected UK GDP report was a real mixed blessing uh, of an economy avoiding recession but also maybe keeping uh, inflation higher than we would like. And it's August. It's not the busiest of time on the markets, but what do we have to look forward to next week? Yeah, but still pretty important. We're going to get an update to this key inflation question next Wednesday. Uh, Inflation for July may fall, fingers crossed, to under 7%. Uh, That would still be amongst the highest in the world, but may just be enough progress 
for the Bank of England to think about dialing back on these dramatic 14 interest rate hikes we've seen so far. Uh, plus, we've got some key interim results from insurers and home builders like Aviva and Persimmon. These are two sectors that have really been in the eye of the interest rate and housing storm so far this year. And it's safe to say that if that inflation number comes in higher than expected, it's going to make certain people like yourselves uh, and my jobs just that little bit busier next week, isn't it? Our jobs busier and a pile a bit more pain, unfortunately, on uh, on UK you know mortgage holders and consumers. OK, Ben, thanks very much for that. Thank you. Welcome back. We can't promise you riches, but national savings and investments have once again bumped up their prize fund to their already super popular premium bonds. So if you're lucky, you could get a million and you don't have to worry about wage rises and all that. It is now at 4.65%, the highest rate since 1999. But while that may sound high, of course, there are no guarantees of bagging a return that high. So is it time, Helen, to plough all our money into premium bonds? Firstly, a little explainer about ns and how they work out their rates, why we've seen them rise quite high recently. Sure. So this was a chunky, chunky rise from ns and I, who run premium bonds. I think we were quite surprised to hear this early in the week. So it's gone up from 4% to 4.65%. That, that's a big jump. And as you said, it's the highest it's been for a really long time. Um, the first thing to know about premium bonds is that is not an interest rate, though. You're not guaranteed to earn 4.65% on the savings that you have with NSNI. It's called a prize fund rate, which is essentially it's the overall annual growth across all of the premium bonds that people own. So that's billions of premium bonds. It's basically essentially think of it as your your kind of the average prize won by everyone who owns premium bonds so you know you might you might earn in prizes much more than 4.65 percent in a year you might also earn absolutely nothing so it's essentially a lottery you might win a million pounds you might win nothing and there's a whole host of prizes in between obviously you're much more likely to win something like 25 pounds than you are a million pounds um but as you said it's really popular people in the uk really really like it and one of the reasons for that is that it's backed by the government. So it's a very, very safe place to hold your savings. And the prizes are tax free as well. So, you know, the chance of getting a million pounds tax free is uh, a good enough kind of incentive for lots and lots of people to put their money into premium bonds. Um, The interesting thing with this rise is that it is kind of taking the interest rate on premium bonds quite close to where the best easy access rates are so best easy access savings rates at the minute are about five percent uh so 4.65 you know that that's getting close to that it's not quite as good um but i think the thing to think about is you know do you want a guaranteed five percent on the easy access account or do you want the uh the excitement of thinking you know i I might win a million pounds and it it, you know it it depends on what your kind of attitude to it is i guess um some sort of savings experts are a bit skeptical um so we spoke to uh james blower who's a well-known kind of savings uh, savings guru and uh he said the vast majority of savers will earn much more by saving in the best easy access savings accounts given where their rates are so we'd only recommend premium bonds should to savers who want the thrill of potentially winning larger prizes and who are comfortable that the odds are such that they're highly unlikely to do so so you know if if you want a bit of a thrill, go for premium bonds. Um, it's, you know, the rates are better than they were last week. So, you know, if, if that's your thing, then then go for it. But you can earn more on a on an easy access account. And it's not just premium bonds that have been given a, a bump up. Some of their other products as well have also got a bit of a rise. They're never really meant to be market leading, are they? But there is that safety element that we like. Exactly. Yeah, they they kind of rely on, uh, yeah, on that safety, you know, government backed, but then other savings accounts are FSCS backed. So, you know, you do generally have protection up to £85,000, even if your bank goes under. Um, But, you know, some people just... They, they like the uh, they like having their money in uh, essentially a government bond. It's the safest, probably possible place that you can put your money. And, you know, you have the fun of checking the website or checking the app every month to see if you've won won a massive prize. Simon, your considered opinion on premium bonds? 
I mean, I've got premium bonds. I think they're a pretty decent place for your money. You can consider them to be almost an easy access account because you can get your money out at very, very short notice and you should get your money within a couple of days. You will get a better rate on easy access. Um, maybe I should move the money having premium bonds into an easy access account for a better guaranteed rate. But then, you know, how, how much are you giving up? It, it depends on how much you've got in there. If you've got the maximum amount in premium bonds, then you should probably consider whether you should be investing some of that money, let alone moving it into a rival savings account, because that is a very large amount. And it's unlikely that most people would need short term access to it. If you've only got a relatively small amount in premium bonds, then you're not giving up that much in terms of the rate. But once you go below a certain amount of money in premium bonds, you start to become statistically less likely to actually meet that average price rate owing to the way that the, the draw is structured. I don't have the figures at hand, but we did get somebody to run a load of very geeky stats on this for, for us a while back. And if you come to the podcast article later on, this is money.co.uk forward slash podcast, I'll stick a link to it in there. Marvellous. Right, Simon, the past few weeks when you've been sunning it, wherever you've been, we've been having a bit of a pop at uh, a fair few companies and organisations for their pretty shoddy customer service and rightly so we we don't dish it out where it's not you but as a fair and balanced podcast that we are you would like to offer some praise for customer service indeed where, simon where indeed. are you experiencing this magical unexpected experience I experienced it from what I've considered to be a very unlikely source, actually, to be honest, to the point where I had steeled myself, even though I knew I was in the right, I had steeled myself for for battle. And I had actually said to Helen on Tuesday morning when I returned to work, I might have a crane on the case for you um, and, and outlined it. So I'll tell you what happened. To answer your first question, I've been in France. Uh, I've been in Western France. I've spent a week with friends near Bergerac. And then we went down to the Atlantic coast, way down the Atlantic coast uh, to about an hour north of Biarritz to an area called okay. Leyland, which is long, endless, sandy beaches with dunes and pine forests behind them. Big waves, sunshine. It was definitely much better weather than it was here. Not as good as it should have been for this time of year, but it was definitely a lot better than it was here. And it was very pleasant indeed. I sat in the sunshine. I felt better when I came back than when I went because I managed to surf every day and did enough exercise to offset the volume of red wine and barbecues that I was consuming uh, in the evenings. Um, And it was it was very pleasant indeed. And what we decided to do was uh, take a couple of days to road trip it back, to travel back, avoid the madness of Saturday on the auto routes and the bottlenecks spend Saturday on the beach and then drive a short distance Saturday night and stay in a town called Saint-Jean-d'Angeli in the Charente maritime uh, Anyway, I found somewhere to stay for that night through booking.com. And I must say, there are many, many downsides to the internet uh, and the modern digital age, and there are many upsides. One of the upsides I should feel compelled to mention is obviously the website, This Is Money, and the ability to listen to the This Is Money podcast. Um, (laughs) Which, Without the internet, we would not be here. Mm -hmm. Um, But also, it is the ability to find places to stay a little bit off the beaten track. Now, I know that this may not be great for some people who own B&Bs and hotels and things like that. I know that sometimes, you know, with these big booking sites, they end up getting a bit of the sharp end of it. But for the consumer... It does make it good. And and it also helps you find places to stay that you wouldn't have otherwise found. So I found a house to stay in, in this French town, two bedroom house, looked very nice, £88 for the night. Brilliant. Comfortably sleep the four of us. And the great thing about finding a self-catering place to stay is then you can make your own dinner and you don't have to pay for the cost of going out for a meal. So it's like, it's great. I booked this in uh, mid-June. Got a message late last week from the property owner saying you meant to be coming to stay on Saturday night um, just to let you know that uh, the bed in the second bedroom has unfortunately been broken um, and uh, I'm trying to get it fixed might not be able to get it fixed by Saturday just wanted to let you know in case you wanted to cancel um, and find somewhere else so I had a look 
very difficult to find somewhere else for a Saturday night in August, close to the main route up from that part of France. So uh, I said, no, no, it's, it's fine. I said, there's a sofa bed at the property anyway, isn't there? Um, so we could use that. Um, so so it will be fine if it's OK for us to still come and stay. And they said, yes, that's, that's absolutely fine. Sofa bed just isn't that comfortable. So I thought I'd just give you the option. But I said, no, no, it's fine. You know, I've got to, to put my children on it anyway. It's fine. Um, uh, so I also like contacted them a couple of times in the next couple of days, you know, just making sure everything was OK. Uh, didn't hear anything back uh, on the Friday, which was like slightly concerning. Then overnight on Friday to Saturday, I got up Saturday morning and I had a message at two o'clock in the morning saying, no, you can't come and stay because I've made a claim on my insurance and uh, I can't uh, have you stay while I've done that. So I replied and said, look, I, I'm, you know, sorry about that. Um, it's absolutely fine. I thought we'd agreed that we'd still come and use the sofa bed. That's absolutely fine with us. We can't find anywhere else to stay at such short notice. Please, can we come and stay? Message back saying, no, you can't come and stay because I've made a claim on the insurance and I'm not allowed to host you while I've made this claim. So we had to find somewhere else to stay. Um, I mean, this was 11 o'clock in the morning on Saturday and we were meant to be arriving. Oh, at, like we, we, we could arrive from four o'clock in the afternoon. Anyway, thanks to the wonders of the internet, I did manage to find us somewhere else to stay while I was sitting on the beach. Um, and but it co obviously cost me more money but more to the point the place for the Saturday night wasn't showing up as cancelled so I contacted them and said it's not showing up as cancelled for me um, you know and they said well it should be but you could just cancel it and I think you'll then get your money back I said no no you need to cancel it because I was in my head I was like if I cancel this I might not get my money back at short notice because it says I'm out of the free cancellation period I said you need to cancel it I didn't hear anything more anyway so we found somewhere else to stay we stayed there it was great it was all fine um, but it cost us more money. So I came back, told this story on Tuesday to, you know, the team and said, Helen, might have a crane on the case for you and so on. But then I contacted booking.com via its customer service chat, something which doesn't always instill a huge degree of confidence in you, does it? The point where you can't find any contact details and you have to start with the chat. Nonetheless, um, I contacted them, outlined all of this on Tuesday at 1.51 p.m. And then at 2.46 p.m., I got a message back. This apologised for the host not honouring our reservation, gave a full refund to my card free of charge for the place that we couldn't stay that night, and then said it would put the £87 difference into my booking.com wallet, which could either be used on future reservations, I was like, oh, great, it's going to be stuck in there, or withdrawn to my bank account. Basically, speedy, simple resolution. I wasn't left out of pocket um, and all done. Like, there was just no arguing. Well, so, so they I, 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 thought, I, should, I thought I should tell people about a good customer do. service experience. I said, bra I was like, bravo. I said this to Lee. I was sat opposite him on Tuesday. I, I said it to him. He's like, you need to write about that. <laughs> it, it just doesn't normally it, happen, does it? But that's the problem, though, isn't it? It's like, actually, what is their job to do has now become exceptional. Yeah. Do you know? Isn't yeah, that, I mean, it was really, that it was says really a lot about that... where we're at at the moment. Yeah, Not I to think so. Rain on their parade, to be fair. Yeah. And I think it's obvious that if somebody cancels on you at a very short notice and that you end up having to pay more, then, you know, you would hope that whatever system you booked it through would, you know, honour the, the price gap. Um, I mean, there's been some suggestions in the comments in the article saying, you know, that that they'll force the the property owner to pay that extra price i don't know i mean if this property owner's claimed on insurance um then maybe the insurance would cover it i don't know the ins and outs but i do know that as the customer if you've booked somewhere and then it gets cancelled <laughs> literally overnight yeah. the day before you're meant to come and stay way after the free cancellation period has finished and you've paid for it then you shouldn't be left out of pocket and you know i wasn't left out of pocket so that's fine I'm totally happy with the situation it was stressful it was annoying but I dealt with it, you know, I don't need any extra money to compensate me for that. I'm not asking for anything like that. Mm. Just don't want to end up out of pocket. So it's quite good. Good resolution. Speedily done within an hour, yeah. basically. Awesome. However, interesting next story. We're going to stick with holidays. And this is another of your journalists experience. Not quite so relaxing. Uh, Helen will will fill you in on the details. 
would you ever go on a mystery holiday? And this is interesting for me because this is something that very recently my other half suggested that we head off on holiday together. I thought, that's lovely. That's lovely. I said, well, you know, where are we going to go? Well, it's, you know, surprise. I thought, oh, that's nice, isn't it? Romantic surprise. No, literally, it's a surprise. It was a mystery trip surprise. So you fill in the details, a bit like a robo advisor. What's your risk levels kind of thing? And then it picks something for you. I mean, I don't know if this is the ultimate in holiday hack, saving me precious brain cells and time in figuring out what I really want in life. Uh, Or is it just a silly idea that will ultimately leave you incredibly disappointed in a rubbish hotel in the middle of nowhere with broken beds? Helen, fill in the details. Yeah, so uh, Toby has gone for something called the ultimate mystery holiday. He saw it on the uh, discount sort of voucher website, Woucher, and he thought, yeah, do you know what? Ultimate mystery holiday. I'm going to go for it. Well, what could go wrong? Um, so basically, this website was advertising uh, flights and two nights accommodation for two people uh, somewhere abroad for £99 a person which sounds just kind of on the edge of too good to be true, isn't it? Like, it's not like it's sort of 20 quid. It's, it's the amount you think, yeah, maybe, maybe that's possible. Maybe I could, maybe that could be something all right. Um, so he looked into it. He said the advert showed tantalising images of New York, Las Vegas, Mexico, along with sun-kissed beach scenes that looked as if they could be Barbados or the Maldives. So, you know, so it sounds good. When he looked into this, the first place he got offered was uh, Sofia in Bulgaria, which, you know, quite nice, but maybe not maybe not as good as Barbados, just just putting it out there. And Toby uh, turned that down. So the thing about this this whole story is uh, Toby has kind of been willing to be very sort of sharp elbowed on this and say, nah, I know it's a mystery holiday, but I don't want to go there. Give me somewhere else. So called them up ask for somewhere else can I can I have another go at the lucky dip he said um and he ended up uh with a holiday to Venice so you know again not quite New York not quite Dubai but it's not really a mystery either if you can kind of barter your way through it but anyway yeah yeah I think he's maybe not not really played the mystery game um (laughs) but you know I I had a conversation with Toby this week about it before the story was published and it was really quite a funny conversation and Toby was like yeah you're definitely not meant to be able to do what I did (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but it, it, either way he got this far yeah he did but I mean it's it's actually it's good that he did this because he kind of worked out as he was going through okay well if I change this how much is it going to cost things like you know where do I fly from can I fly from an airport that's near me or do I have to go somewhere else and this is this is the thing it they seem to every time you asked to make a change like that they just write the price up again and again or they say oh this is in peak time so you have to pay a surcharge you want to book an extra day there's another surcharge and it ended up that this holiday actually was going to cost quite a lot more than 99 pounds a person so I think he said in the end it cost about 270 pounds for him and his wife so a bit bit more than 99 uh in the end and was it really what he wanted I think that's the thing isn't it you know could you have booked something else that you probably would have liked more with that £270? Mm. Maybe you could. Um, I think the the kind of lesson from this is, you know, re- if you're going to go for something like this, really dig into the terms and conditions. Um, so he found out that only one in a thousand holidays bought on this website are actually to Barbados. So be realistic, um, you know, work out your, actually, your actual odds of, getting somewhere good well, look at all the surcharges you know how much more can they charge you if you want to yeah go from a different airport or you know swap to a different hotel I think Toby was really willing to fight his corner on this and he ended up with something all right but I don't know someone not as uh not as kind of gung-ho might end up with something a bit a bit rubbish you know perhaps if you could get yourself to Barbados for 99 quid you could just jump the, the rubbish hotel and pay for yourself to stay somewhere else. But I mean, are you be 99 pounds to Barbados, but you only go for three days or two days. Uh, how's that? Yeah, I mean, that's no. basically 99 pounds to sit on a plane and come back on a plane. And now in the old days, of course, in the early days of air travel, people would have gladly paid that sort of money just to travel on a plane. But I think those moments have passed. One trick I would say is mm. uh, looking for newish hotels. 
So hotels that haven't had long enough on some of the booking sites to get any ratings or things like that. Bit of a gamble because you can't see what other people say about them. But quite often will offer some quite keen prices because they want to get people through the door and they don't have the ratings that would justify them um, trying to do it. So that's a good way of trying to save a bit of money. So I actually did that on my most recent holiday, booked a very last minute, uh, five days in Ibiza. And we found a really good deal on a hotel that looked really nice, but it only opened the day before we arrived. Um, yeah, so quite a big gamble. Um, so I think it had been, uh, it wasn't being built, like it wasn't, we weren't going to turn up into a building. So it had been another hotel and they'd taken over and refurbed it, but it was just opening like 24 hours before we got there. Um, so my rationale for it was, well it's only Ibiza like if the absolute worst comes to the worst we can't even find anywhere else to stay like we can just go to the airport and wait until we can get a flight home for like 40 quid or something like absolute worst comes to the worst you know I understand that it's different you know we're just a couple obviously you don't want to be doing that if you've got kids or you know anything like that we were like uh you know what's the worst that can happen we maybe spend a night in the airport and then fly home um but yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a risk but it worked out you know it was it was very nice but again didn't have any reviews and uh in fact no it did have one review on google maps which said why is this listed as a hotel it looks like a building site um from about three months it before was. uh it was about three months before so i was like well i think they've had time to you know finish um and i did call them the, uh, a couple of days before and say just to be clear like this hotel does exist now and they were like yeah yeah, yeah it's fine it does so... ex- oh my that's the worst nightmare <laughs> like oh my god it's fine but it was there that is good news uh finally though helen it's what influencers can only dream of going viral and you achieved it recently was it with an award-winning investigative piece an outstanding podcast appearance no it was an old plastic bag that wasn't even yours reveal all yeah so this is honestly the weirdest thing that's happened to me for such a long time um a few weeks ago monday evening sitting on my sofa watching tv my boyfriend is packing his gym kit to take to work the next day. Um, he pulls out a plastic bag and I notice that this plastic bag is so ancient. So it's a River Island plastic bag. Um, it's supposed to be like, you know, one of those ones oh, like so going. Well, yeah, they are. I mean, that was kind Ooh. of my first thought, but no, they, they very much still are. Um, but this bag, it's, you know, was back in its heyday. Um, it was brightly coloured plastic bag, had a picture of a few uh, a few models on it, like modelling the River Island clothes. Um, but today the bag is uh, it's kind of hanging on by a thread. So it's the, the design is almost completely washed off. It looks like kind of TV static, very, very old plastic bags. Of course, I say to my boyfriend, how old is that bag? And then he comes back and he says it's a decade old. He's been carrying this carrier bag for a decade. How do people do that? Why? Why? Did, why? Where? I, like, I just needed to know the story. It's like bag for life. Absolutely. Well, bag for a decade. Yeah. He has taken the phrase "bag to life" to its absolute limit. Um, so I, I just found this quite funny. So I posted a tweet about it saying, "You know, oh my boyfriend's so sustainable. He's been using this bag for a decade." And then posted a picture of the bag. Um, didn't really think much more of it. Uh, and then the next morning, it's got thousands and thousands of mm-hmm. retweets and likes. People absolutely loved it. I mean, like no one was more shocked than me. Actually, someone was more shocked than me, which is my boyfriend. He doesn't really use social media. And we're just like, what? And why do people like this picture of me in a bag? Like, I just I don't understand what's happening. I don't understand what's happening. But people absolutely loved it. Um, it's, now, it's now got up to like. 1.8 million likes which is just, I just don't I, I don't understand it but people went mad for this really old plastic bag um but what's interesting I mean mm. is it interesting I find it quite interesting is that people are now getting in touch with their old plastic bags I have seen some I've seen some bags in the last few weeks Georgie I've seen bags from like the 80s like all kinds of shops that don't even exist anymore there are Amazing. people out there who collect plastic bags and I I absolutely love it I'm, I'm so here for it have you been inundated with phone calls for people wanting to bid for your River Island, your boyfriend's River Island plastic bag yet? Or No, I haven't, no, um, which is, you know, if, if anyone wants to put one in, you know, he's, he's right, open yeah. to offers. So, yep. Yeah. Starting at 
What do you reckon? What do you reckon? Ooh, well, I did actually have a look at some plastic bags on eBay and there was one, a PlayStation <laughs> carrier bag from the 90s. It's going for £75, Georgie. So, Oh, my I'm, word. I'm not going to be that punchy, but I 20 quid. Start the bidding at 20 quid. All right. Yeah. Sounds reasonable. Sounds reasonable. All right, then. You can keep up to date with all the latest breaking money news. Just go to thisismoney.co.uk or download the app. If you have any comments or questions for the team, anything you'd like them to look into or you want to bid higher than 20 quid for Helen's boyfriend's River Island plastic bag, Simon? You can email us at editor at thisismoney.co.uk. You can tweet us at thisismoney and you can come to thismoney.co.uk forward slash podcast to find all podcast pass and join the debate and read the comments and there will be more carrier bag based stories coming up Can't on wait. this is money in weeks to come don't wait and if you like our podcast why not rate us wherever you found us it helps other people find us too don't forget you can stay on top of what's going on in the markets by tuning in to the digest and invest podcast by Toro. go to your regular podcast platform and listen on the go digest and invest by Toro, the podcast for those interested in trading and investing